Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us again uh, for the postdoc colloquium. Uh, unfortunately, today, I believe uh, Deirdre will not be able to join us as she is at a conference in Regina, if I remember correctly. Um, nonetheless, uh, for today's talk, uh, we have Toboka uh, Chalebwa. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Yeah. Uh, presenting. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Presenting on more Leoville numbers. Uh, Tboka, I believe your camera may be glitched. You're frozen on my screen. Oh, okay, so let's see. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see how to fix this. So. Perhaps uh, like turn it off, turn it back on. All right, yeah. Let's see. Okay. And then let's do oh, There we go. All right. So All right. Back here. Okay. And then, perfect. Uh, the slides back on? Yes, we see that. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Yeah. So I think uh, our talk today will have uh, two parts, and uh, both parts will be connected by the concept of uh, Liouville numbers. So let's just quickly go to the definitions and uh, get on with the talk. So recall that uh, a complex number is algebraic if it is a zero of a polynomial with integer coefficients. And uh, it is transcendental if it is not algebraic. So it is not a zero of a polynomial with integer or real coefficients. And um, we've got examples of fairly well known or famous examples of uh, transcendental numbers, e pi, e to the pi. I believe this is called a uh, Gelfond's constant. Uh, e squared, etc. These are all transcendental numbers. Now, a Liouville number, a real number, is said to be a Liouville number if you can actually approximate it very, very closely with a sequence of uh, rational numbers. So, uh, what do we mean by that? In particular, if for any integer n, you can always find a rational number pq such that pq is very, very much close to your number psi. And uh, how do we measure this uh, closeness or this, how do we quantify this? Well, by simply just saying that uh, the distance between psi and pq is less than one over q to the n. So we measure the degree of closeness by the denominator of our approximating rational. Uh, but given that definition, we may still wonder why do we, why would one define what's special about this definition? Why would one make this definition to begin with? So let's just see the motivation for this. Uh, so this is because back in the 1800s, uh, Newville proved a theorem which we can take to be a so-called uh, transcendence criteria. So that is um, a way with which we can test whether a given number is transcendental or not. So he basically says that if you have an algebraic number, alpha, so this is a zero of the polynomial with integer coefficients. And um, in particular, if we insist that alpha is an irrational algebraic number, so this is in particular an algebraic number of degree greater than or equals to two, then there exists a constant 
such that the distance between alpha and any rational number is always greater than this constant over q to the n. So in other words, irrational algebraic numbers cannot be very, very well approximated by sequences of rational numbers. So there is a lower bound on how close we can get to an irrational algebraic number if we would like to approximate it by a rational number. So then this means that if you can exhibit a number which violates this inequality, we immediately know that such a number should, there's no option, such a number should be transcendental. So this is why Liouville's theorem here, sometimes we could, we could call it or uh, understand it as a transcendence criteria or a test for transcendence. And this is what led to the definition of a Liouville number that we see here, because this is exhibiting a number that violates this uh, lower bound on uh, approximation of alpha. So given that uh, an example of a Liouville number would be the, the classical example of a Liouville number is the so-called Liouville constant. And this is just the sum of um, one over 10 to the n factorial. So this is a very sparse number, if, if you will. Uh, for instance, you've got a one over here and the next one is 96 zeros away. And then the next one might be six factorial, so around 500. So there'll be 500 other zeros before you see another one. So around six factorial, yeah. Okay. So that's an example of a Liouville number. Uh, and more generally, you can construct Liouville numbers of this type by just starting off with a, an arbitrary integer base b greater than two. And then you can form an infinite sequence of ak, provided you're saying the ak's are integers that are less than your base b. And then if you form the number x in the manner that I have described here, if it's just the sum ak over b to the n factorial, and of course, you insist that infinitely many of the AKs are not zero. Then this is a Liouville number. So in particular, it is a transcendental number. Uh, but how would you go about proving such a thing? So the method is rather elementary. So let's remember how we defined our number here. All you'd have to do is to truncate, take the nth truncation of uh, the series definition of our number, and then you can let your denominator be your base to the n factorial if you were to let your numerator be qn times this translation. Then you can actually then show that uh, this sequence pn over qn really approximates x very, very closely. But in particular, you can sort of just work it out and then you see that the distance between x and uh, this sequence pn over qn is strictly less than one over qn to the n. And it, therefore, we satisfy the definition of a Liouville number. Uh, a few facts about the set of uh, Liouville numbers. Uh, L is uncountable, but it also has a big measure zero. So it's a thin set, so, so to speak, the sparse set. Now, uh, Liouville's theorem is too strong or weak, depending on how you view things, in the sense that I think even after Liouville exhibited, because the uh, Liouville numbers were the first numbers to be uh, shown to be transcendental, but I guess in some sense it was still not satisfactory. The number feels a bit artificial. It, it was made to to be transcendental, so to speak. So still, uh, there were classical numbers like pi and e, which at the time of Liouville's theorem had not been proven to, to be transcendental. They were thought to be transcendental, but they had not yet been verified. And uh, so even though Liouville's theorem gives us a transcendence criteria, it is too weak in the sense that 
you cannot use it to verify the transcendence of a number like pi or e. Uh, but uh, well, what do we do then in that case? So in particular, pi and e are not real numbers. That's also what I'm saying. All right. So to deal with these, uh, so this was around uh, 1873, 1882, probably four, four or five decades after Liouville's theorem. Uh, we start off with the hemic lindman firestrass theorems. So this is just a chain of related theorems, each one ge generalizing the one before it. So hemic lindman proved the beautiful theorem that um, if alpha is a non-zero algebraic number, then e to the alpha is transcendental. So in particular, e to the one, which is e, is so transcendental. And then Lindman Vastras, so this was a couple of years after Henrik Lindman, uh, they proved a generalization of uh, the Henrik Lindman theorem. So if you have n algebraic numbers that are linearly independent over the rationals, then all their exponentials. So this should, the indexing here should be the other way around. Then the exponentials e to the alpha one up to e to the alpha n. Uh, algebraically independent over Q as well. Uh, so you can see, in fact, the Hemet, I think Hemet was the first to prove that E is transcendental. And then it was Lindman who generalized the theorem to E to the alpha for an arbitrary algebraic alpha, which is non zero. All right, so corollaries of uh, the Hemet Lindman Weistras theorems. Uh, I've mentioned the first one already. Uh, e, which is e to the one, is uh, transcendental. And if you use the contrapositive of uh, Hemet Lindman, since e to the pi i is one, an algebraic number, that would mean pi i, and in particular pi, is transcendental. And then um, a corollary, a nice, interesting corollary of uh, the Lindman Weierstrass theorem particular, you can deduce that the log of alpha, sine of alpha, x sine of alpha, etc, are transcendental numbers as well, where alpha is uh, an algebraic number. So this gives you a way of generating new transcendental numbers uh, in particular. All right. Now, we'll move on to the so-called uh, classification of Moller. So this was back in the, probably early 20th century, thereabouts. Now, what Moller does is, hey, we've got a set of algebraic numbers and we've got a set of transcendental numbers, but you can actually refine uh, the set of transcendental numbers and partition them into classes of related transcendental numbers, uh, so to speak. There, there's a certain measure of transcendence that you can attach to. So how really transcendental is your transcendental number? And uh, so there are different ways in which this can or has been done in transcendental number theory. Uh, but so today I'll just briefly mention uh, Mahler's classification. And uh, so what I've said is, uh, or the way that Mahler's classification works is that we classify a given number, complex number, be it algebraic or transcendental, according to the rate at which any given polynomial with integer coefficients uh, goes to zero when you evaluate it at that number. So this is a very hand-wavy uh, description of Mahler's classification. But um, what suffices for our current discussion is that we know that we've got, uh, we start off with a set of complex numbers. And all we need to know is that this can be partitioned into four subsets. The A numbers are as you would suspect the algebraic numbers. And then all the transcendental numbers can be partitioned into three classes called the S, T, and U numbers. 
And uh, I think there's belief that uh, S here was sort of an honor for Mola's um, teacher, who was, uh, I think it's Carl Ludwig Siegel, and then T and U are just the next letters of the alphabet that follow. But so now we know that you can further partition uh, transcendental numbers into three classes. And uh, the important part, or one of the important characteristics of Mola's classification is that if two numbers, complex numbers, are algebraically dependent, then they belong to the same class. So for instance, for now, let's say we do not know what, let's say we do not know what E, what class E falls into, but we know that E and E squared up E to the three and so on, all belong to whatever class that the number E belongs to. Say not pi to say pi, pi squared. And, yeah. and uh, so the first fact that we know is that if two numbers are algebraically dependent, then they should belong to the same Mola class. Two, this is almost a refinement, and this is also a theorem by Mola as well. This is almost a refinement of the Hemet Lindman theorem. If alpha is algebra then non zero, e to the alpha is actually in the class S. And uh, in fact, S is the biggest class amongst the molar partitions in the sense that it has Lebesgue measure one, it has full Lebesgue measure, and then TU, and of course the algebraic numbers have Lebesgue measure zero. And uh, Whereas the algebraic numbers are countable, the rest of these other classes are uncountable. And uh, the Liouville numbers, uh, turns out they fall in the class U. And uh, of course, I've not really given the descriptions of these classes. And if you are interested, I, I can get them at the end of the talk. And uh, I've also included uh, some nice references. But for now, we can just satisfy ourselves with um, the existence of a partition of uh, transcendental numbers. Now, just a, a question. If you start off with a Liouville number now, uh, can we immediately deduce that the exponential of that Liouville number is a transcendental number? Uh, with Hamid Lindman, of course, remember it works if alpha is an algebraic number. So can we generate a new transcendental number from, say, Liouville numbers. And um, so there are deeper theorems, uh, especially uh, deeper results that sort of come from a in-depth study of these smaller classes, uh, from which I think you could somehow deduce an answer to, to this result. And uh, Essentially, there are some quantitative results that the so-called are transcendence measures. There are quantitative results that would tell you that if a number is transcendental of this form or of this type, then you can always approximate it by say a sequence of algebraic numbers to this degree of accuracy or if a number is algebraic, then you can't approximate it to this degree of accuracy. So if you start off with one of those theorems and you were able to find the rate of approximation, so to speak, by algebraic numbers of E to the Liouville number, then you could tell whether or not it is a transcendental number. So that is the point I'm trying to make that this uh, whatever answer we're going to get for this question, it's not, it would not be entirely surprising to experts, but um, nonetheless, let's see whether we could uh, achieve this via somewhat more elementary means. So we've got a level theorem here. So this was a uh, joint work with uh, Sid Morris and uh, in fact, it's a little bit more general in the sense that we are working with uh, the whole class of uh, U numbers, not just the Liouville numbers, but um, let alpha be a Liouville number. 
then the following numbers are transcendental, e to the alpha. Um, by trig of alpha, I mean a generic trigonometric function, so sine, cos, tan. So trig of alpha will be transcendental. Uh, hyperbolic trig of alpha will also be transcendental, as well as the inverses of these functions here. So logarithm of alpha, if alpha is a legal number, log alpha will be transcendental. Arc trig of alpha and uh, arc trig h of alpha. I thought this was an efficient notation, but yes, all right. So cinch your you know, cos cos hyperbolic. The inverse of that uh, will also be the transcendental number uh, if you evaluate it at a legal number or in general a u number. So I've added a proof of uh, for, for one of these functions uh, just to sort of exhibit how one uses the, some of those properties of the molar classification and with relatively, yeah, very elementary straightforward means you can deduce this. So of course, uh, as usual, you start off um, for contradiction's sake by assuming that rather accent of alpha is algebraic where alpha is a Liouville number. And remember, at some point, we say the set of Liouville numbers is a U number. All right, so suppose mu, which is accent alpha, is algebraic. Uh, and then you remember that accent of alpha can actually be expressed as the logarithm of a function involving alpha, of an algebraic function of alpha. That's just alpha plus the square root of alpha squared plus one. Not very important, but yes, this is an accent of alpha. Now we assume that this is algebraic. So e to an algebraic number, we know that e to an algebraic number is an S number. This is uh, Moller's theorem. So that means in particular, this quantity here, e to the mu, is an S number. But on the other hand, remember our alpha is a legal number and therefore it is a U number. We can just say X is alpha. And then we look at this quantity here, call it Y. Now, X and Y actually satisfy this polynomial here. So in other words, they are algebraically dependent, uh, which means Y itself is a U number because X is a U number. And uh, by Moller's classification of two numbers algebraically dependent, they belong to the same class. So that's a contradiction because on the one hand, we said E to the U is an S number, but then now we deduce that E to the U is a U number. So this is sort of, and uh, for, for the rest of uh, the other functions, it's sort of a more or less, uh, similar kind of uh, argument, you sort of have to use other, I'd say, alternative expressions of some of these functions. You know, the same way we worked with uh, the logarithm of alpha plus this for accent of alpha, but um, it's uh, more or less a similar approach. And then you could deduce. Uh, the results for the remaining functions in our in these families. All right, so that I think actually concludes part one of uh, our talk. So basically, using the Liouville numbers plus Moller's classification to generate quote unquote new transcendental numbers, essentially. All right, so part two is what I called the Edos Liouville sets. So we're just pivoting to something slightly different. Uh, remember that we said the set of Liouville numbers is uncountable, but it has limited measure zero. However, in 
around 1962, Paul Erdos proved a very remarkable theorem. He says that any real number can actually be expressed as a sum of two Liouville numbers. And in fact, he also says that any real number can be expressed as a product of two Liouville numbers. It's a very nice, beautiful paper, two page paper, and a very, very approachable, very approachable um, thing. Um, anybody can enjoy it. So, but I mean, what, what this means to, to begin with, you know, we've got this set of Lebesgue measures zero, but I guess intuitively, it's what we are getting here is that whilst the Liouville numbers are small in a, in a metrical sense, but they are sort of strategically sprinkled around the real line in such a way that any number can be expressed as a sum or product of uh, Liouville numbers. So uh, we come up with uh, some definitions and this is the first one is just redefining something that's that has a name. I guess we just wanted to put it in the context of say Edos Liouville sets. But uh, we say a subset of uh, the real numbers has the Edos property. If its sum set will give you the whole of R, so the sum of the elements in, in, in the set gives you the whole of R. Now we say a set has the Edos Liouville or the EL property. If in addition, it is actually a subset of the Liouville numbers. So to the Edos property, we just add the additional clause that your set is a subset of the Liouville numbers. Okay, so it's just a definition. What can we do with it? It's rather suggestive to regarding to regarding where we are going. So a trivial reformulation therefore of Edo's theorem in light of this um, definition is that the set L of Liouville numbers, yes, I should have said at some point that this uh, Kelly L represents the Liouville numbers, but uh, L has the Edo's property, well, because it is a subset of itself and it has the some set property in the sense that yeah, any real number is a sum of two elements from L. From so L has the Edos Liouville property in particular. All right, so after we have recast things in, in, in this light, we, it's, it's suggestive, you know, we can start now asking questions. So, are there other subsets of uh, the real numbers that have the Edos property? Uh, another question, perhaps more interesting. Are there other subsets of L or even R yeah, that have the Edos Liouville property in particular? If so, is there a smallest Edos Liouville set? So, and uh, the answers, well, the first question is sort of almost boring or trivial. I mean, if we haven't really restricted anything and we say, can you find you know, subsets of the real numbers such that you can generate the rest of the real numbers by just taking sums of the elements? You could pretty much just start off with all the real numbers, remove one element. That would be, that set would be a set that is the Edos property. Oh, you know, can just get creative. I think you could probably even remove a, a countable set and probably even more, and you'd still have the Edos property. So, yeah, but I mean, that's, that's a question. And then, so second question is, though, that's, that's the one that's interesting. Uh, we are now, we know that we have the Liouville numbers and any real number is the sum of two Liouville numbers. Can we reduce the Liouville numbers? Is there some subset, smaller subset of the Liouville numbers that still has the Edos Liouville property? Now, in this smallest, that in other words, 
any real number can be expressed as a sum of elements of this two elements of this uh, smaller set. And if so, is there a smallest endosmeal set? Can we find the smallest one such that if we removed any other element from that now, we can no longer generate all of R by pairwise sums of elements of that smallest set. So I think these are somewhat more concrete, uh, nicer questions that warrant a bit of attention. All right, so we found, say, I'd say less than three, um, Edos Levial sets, so to, to speak, in the, in the literature. Um, so, and, and these, of course, came up. It's not, it's, not, it's not that maybe, say, people wanted to generate them and then you know, they, they came up with them. They, in fact, sort of came up as byproducts of something else that has been done. And then uh, somebody has to maybe define a certain subset of neural numbers, satisfying some other property. And then they just happen to be a G delta dense subset of uh, the neural numbers. And oh, if you, then it just so happens that in fact you can write all real numbers as sums of two elements of such a subset, you know, so sort of just a, a happy, uh, nice byproduct. But uh, in any case, uh, we do have what's called a, uh, the ultra levial numbers. So essentially, if you remember how we defined levial numbers, we say that, well, a, a number is a levial number if you can find a rational PQ such that one over Q to the N, uh, such that the distance between your number and Q over Q is less than one over P or Q to the N. So, the definition of an ultra levial number is much, much stronger than that because we are now taking exponential of the denominator. So such numbers exist and they happen to be uncountable. And um, so this was in a 2014 paper by um, Diego Mack and uh, Carlo Moreira. They, they were studying something else, but they had to define this set of so called uh, ultra levial numbers. And turns out that they have the Edos legal property. They are a proper subset of uh, legal numbers, and you can generate every real number from them by just taking sums of pairs of elements. And then also in, in, in another paper, uh, 2010, there was a paper by uh, Koman and Poletsky, and they also define a certain proper subset of um, legal numbers, and they, they needed to, they needed to essentially put a certain bound on how fast the approximants or the sequence of approximants PN over QN grows. And uh, with, with, with that in mind, this, that set or subset of legal numbers is um, also, or also has an Eddos legal property, so to speak. So, Okay, and then what's next? So once again, uh, Sid and I looked at this, let's see, uh, this, this question or these two questions uh, from this slide to see, okay, but could we find the smallest? And also are they, because we found these sort of isolated examples here and they uh, could, is there a, a unifying, could one find a unifying framework uh, from which to study this question? is the smallest one. And um, so we have a little result. As it turns out, there is no smallest uh, edos legal set. In particular, for instance, you can find a nested sequence uh, of uh, subsets of legal numbers, uh, proper containment, such that each one is uh, um, has an the Edos legal property or it's an Edos legal set. So furthermore, in fact, there are two to the cardinality of the continuum Edos legal sets. 
such that no two of which are homeomorphic. So this is sort of a topological um, uh, approach to, to this question. We sort of took, instead of um, taking the, the more local approach of just you know, working with the, the, the Liouville numbers proper, uh, once you sort of take a step back, you realize that, and in fact, this um, Eros, when he proved his theorem, he basically provided two proofs. The first one being just working directly with that, take start off with an arbitrary real number, and then show how you can decompose it into a sum of two Liouville numbers. So getting your hands dirty using the definition of Liouville numbers to do that. The second one, once you sort of take a step back, you realize that really there's nothing very special about the set of Liouville numbers in, in that setting. Um, what you are basically just using is the fact that this is a G delta dense subset of the real numbers. And any G delta dense subset of the real numbers will have the Eddos property. Uh, remember G delta would just mean it is in countable intersection of open sets um, open with regards to the Euclidean topology because we are, we are talking about um, subsets of R. So that is essentially just uh, once you take a step back, you realize that that is the, that is what's at the heart of what's happening here in terms of um, what, what would allow a set to have the Eddos property. So now once, if, if you approach things from that, perspective, we realize that there are, well, way more than many uh, of these Eddos level sets due to the canal of the continuum. Um, all right, so how, how would you sort of go about uh, proving this? Um, so yeah, I've, I've added, I've listed um, a method here and uh, uses, apart from maybe one or two uh, places uh, where we use, um, I guess I maybe, I, don't, I could get in trouble for this, but I mean, from my perspective, because I'm not part of the topology, so I think some, I would call some results obscure, but they may sort of be well-known results in the topology community. But yeah, apart from some results that I've seen uh, obscure here and there that we used, uh, the rest of the argument is rather elementary. Um, but I guess obscurity is relative. All right, so how would you go about doing that? Basically, first of all, uh, we start by noticing that the set of irrational numbers P, uh, that's one other thing that I learned uh, that uh, uh, whenever whenever I see this symbol here, I sort of trip up because to me, this symbolizes the set of prime numbers that again, there's a community out there which uh, denotes the set of irrational numbers by P. So yes, so start by showing that the set of uh, irrational numbers is uh, homeomorphic to the set of uh, Liouville numbers. And then we can recall or show that the Liouville numbers form a dense G delta subset of the irrational numbers. Now, so you have shown that the irrationals are homeomorphic to the Liouville numbers. Now, the irrationals have an uncountable G dense set, G dense or dense G delta subset, which is F. That also means your set L of Liouville numbers has a dense G delta subset. You can denote it by L1 because so the topology since P, the set of irrational numbers and the set of Liouville numbers are topologically similar, so to speak, that they're homeomorphic. That means the topological properties that P has would also be present in, in L if you, once you've shown that these two are homeomorphic. Now, we are at a point where we said our Liouville numbers also have a dense G delta subset. We can call it L1. Now, you could also say density is a, somewhat a 
transitive property. If, uh, if A is a dense subset of B and B is dense in C, then you could show that A is dense in C. So in other words, L1 will be a dense G delta subset of the irrationals. And what do we need for the Eddos property? We just need a subset, which is a dense G delta subset of the real or irrational numbers. Then you have the Eddos property. So L1 has the Eddos property. But then what do you do? Just go back and repeat the argument. Just replace L with L1. You'll get an L2. You'll get an L3. So that's sort of the, 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 the skeleton of the, the, the argument. And then of course, there's yeah, a few subtleties here and there where we use some kind of a counting argument to sort of show that there's um, two to the cardinality of the continuum, um, depending on where you fall, uh, you could say this is two to the two to the aleph not or two to the aleph one, but two to the cardinality of the continuum. Um, and then also with regards to the first result, there's maybe a few subtleties here and there when we show that uh, indeed there's are proper containment. And in fact, the pairwise difference between uh, the sets is actually, ha actually has um, cardinality of the continuum. It's an, it's an uncountable set. All right, so there's a little bit of um, uh, bibliography. And uh, so for uh, Moller sets, uh, remember we, we studied uh, the Moller's partition earlier and, uh, and much, much more. I would recommend the book by Jan Bujo that is um, approximation by algebraic numbers. And then uh, we mentioned a paper by Kovan and Polatsky and the paper by Diego Mac and uh, Carlo Moreira, uh, where they studied the ultra legal numbers. All right, so that's all I had for you. Uh, thank you. All right, thank you so much. Okay. Uh, do we have any questions? Uh, also, uh, Taboka, I believe your webcam may have died as well. Once, once again? Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right, yeah, I think I shall fix that. And, um,